RTS games don't work on consoles. This is a well-established rule. While the majority of genres these days are designed with the console market in mind, the RTS, or real-time strategy game, has never quite made that jump. Despite being an incredibly popular genre, because of the very foundations of the genre, RTS games call for a lot of micromanaging and a lot of menus, a lot of panning across battlefields and a lot of reading. Generally speaking, they are much easier and much more fun to control with a mouse and keyboard, a setup which gives you significantly more control for fine details. A controller is an intensely limited way to interact with a game when you compare it to a classic PC setup. It's just that for most games, like a shooter or a racer, that more limited setup is fine, in fact preferable to a lot of people. But the RTS is a genre built for complexity, and complexity is best controlled with a mouse. Being such a PC-centric genre, there is a certain amount of crossover between the hardcore RTS fans and the PC master race crowd. The types who see console gaming as a dumbed-down version of gaming for the casuals, and as much as that smug superiority gets on my nerves, they're not always wrong about that. Halo Wars is absolutely a dumbed-down version of an RTS, but a game being simpler isn't always a bad thing, and the fact is, making something simple is a hell of a lot harder than you think it is. Halo Wars is the product of pure corporate greed. Sort of. Halo Wars is the first game in the series not to be developed by Bungie, but instead developed by Ensemble Studios. They made their name with a series of historical RTS games called Age of Empires and were acquired by Microsoft in 2001. They wanted to make an RTS game specifically to be played on console, a market that had been largely untapped, and the games that had tried were mostly not very good. About two years into that project, Microsoft came up to them and said, hey, why don't you make this a Halo game? Bungie were reportedly not very happy about this. According to Ensemble Studios founder Tony Goodman, the feeling from Bungie at the time was that Microsoft was whoring out the franchise, so safe to say they weren't exactly thrilled about the idea. It's not completely inaccurate, although I'd maybe use more pleasant language. We've got these guys working on a console RTS game, and our biggest game just happens to be a console exclusive. Why not merge these two ideas and make a lot more money? Microsoft owns Halo and they owned Bungie at the time, so there wasn't really anything they could do about it. Halo Wars is also Ensemble Studios' last ever game. The company was dissolved by Microsoft shortly before the game actually came out. Different developers have talked about different reasons why. Ensemble had an unhealthy crunch culture, they went massively over time and budget on basically every single project they worked on. But I think most importantly, they were working on RTS games during a time in the games industry when RTS games were on decline, specifically because of their failure to adapt to consoles. Halo Wars was supposed to save them by bridging the gap and bringing the RTS to consoles, and the company was dissolved before the game even came out. The better irony, of course, being that Halo Wars was massively successful and is still one of the best-selling RTS games on console ever made. It's kind of a miracle that with all that, Halo Wars is a genuinely good game and not just a mess. Not just a good RTS game for consoles, but a good RTS game in general, and a good Halo game too. Despite not being what they originally intended, they adapted Halo perfectly to the RTS genre and it all comes together in a really interesting package. It didn't spark a console RTS revolution or anything like that, the genre still struggles to get a foothold on that market, but it did prove that it can be done, and it can be done well. Wars is a prequel set 20 years before the events of Halo 1, and it follows the crew of one human ship, the UNSC Spirit of Fire, and their battles across the galaxy. 
In Halo 1, the war with the Covenant is not going well. Humanity is on their last legs down from a galaxy-spanning civilization to their last home world. Twenty years before that, humanity is still on the back foot, though not quite as badly as all that. This is an era where victory without a miracle still seemed possible. The story begins on Harvest, a human colony world that has been the site of a five-year-long campaign to try and retake the planet from Covenant control, as relayed by one of the game's four main characters, Captain Cutter. Captain's Report, February 4th, 2531. Five years. Five long years. That's how long it took us to get Harvest back. The first thing anyone will notice about the Halo Wars campaign is the cutscenes, all done by CGI Studio Blur. For the time, and a good ten years afterwards, they were completely cutting edge. They're certainly starting to look dated now, especially the character models, but even now the graphical fidelity of these scenes is still insane for the time. Comparing it to basically any other game from the time, even other Halo games, nothing else competes. They lend the game that cinematic Halo quality that the more abstract graphics of an RTS game can't really capture on their own. And they also held gloss over a lot of the much less impressive writing of Halo Wars compared to the trilogy. Halo Wars doesn't have a bad story, but it's certainly not compelling in the way Halo 2 or 3 are. The characters fall into very typical archetypes, and the storytelling isn't nearly as tight as the trilogy, leaving a lot of obvious plot holes and very strange pacing. While Halo 2 and 3 felt like the levels bending to the whims of the story, Halo Wars feels a lot more traditional in its campaign construction, with the story bending to the whims of the levels. That's not all bad, especially in an RTS game where the game's story pacing is much slower than average. A typical level of Halo Wars takes twice as long than any mission in one of the FPS games just by the very nature of the genre. It's a slower paced game. All of the important story beats of the game are in cutscenes because it's pretty much impossible to deliver them in-game with your connection to the world being so detached and impersonal. Instead, each mission is about delivering a unique gameplay experience. You would only really replay a mission of Halo Wars for the gameplay itself. If you want the full story, you can just look up the cutscenes on YouTube. The vast majority of in-game dialogue boils down to, we need to destroy that base, we need to clear that LZ, and other generic gameplay-driven callouts. Our primary mission here is to reach that structure. Destroying that base is a secondary objective. Spirit of Fire, Red Team. The Covenant are getting control of the city fast. Suggest setting up new ground operations. We only have a little time to prep the base for the Covenant attacks. Let's get to it. The gameplay is the real draw of Halo Wars anyway. I wasn't kidding when I said Halo Wars is a dumbed down RTS. It's one of the simplest RTS games out there. And it lacks a lot of the features that other military RTS games have as standard. Rather than viewing that simplicity as a mistake, which a lot of RTS fans do, I view it as Halo Wars' greatest strength, because that streamlined focus also makes it a much easier to understand and actually play than the vast majority of RTS games. Halo Wars was designed from a controls first perspective, the idea being that if you're going to make an RTS game work on console, you can't just port the same ideas from a PC RTS. You need to design the game from the ground up within the limitations of an Xbox controller. In many ways, it was aiming to do the same thing that Halo 1 did for console FPS games, streamlining and simplifying the genre in order to reach a wider audience. This is why Halo Wars is built around radial menus. Base building, constructing units, upgrading units, using leader abilities, it's all controlled via these simplified radial menus. A menu system that specifically does not work on a PC, it only makes sense with a joystick, and that also means it's easier to navigate on a controller. Radial menus are much more limited than a traditional boxy menu, so there comes the next simplification. Every unit, building, and upgrade for those units and buildings has to fit on a six-space radial menu, and that is an intense limitation to impose on an RTS game. Three unit buildings, three support buildings, three types of each kind of unit, three upgrades for each unit, a pattern of threes that echoes across pretty much everything because three is a nice simple number. Halo Wars doesn't allow the free placement of buildings, instead each building radiates off a main base structure that can only be constructed in predefined areas. Halo Wars also has a comparatively a minuscule unit cap, which is to say the maximum amount of guys and tanks that you're allowed to have out in the field at once, with a maximum of 40 unit slots for the UNSC and 50 for the Covenant, and the caveat that it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. More powerful units will cost more unit slots. 
Hilawar's maps are significantly smaller than other RTS maps of the time, and even just in overall concept, Hilawar's lacks many systems that other RTS games would use to add complexity, like needing to power your bases, or setting up supply lines, or any number of additional things that you can add. The only part of war that Halo Wars really cares about is the part where people shoot at each other. It's a bare bones RTS experience, and that's the genius of it. Most RTS games are kind of overwhelming to new players. I have tried many times now to get into Civilization VI, and on hour 4 of a single game I quite simply start losing the will to live, being completely drowned in different systems and currencies and tech trees, and Civ VI itself is considered too easy and dumbed down by hardcore RTS fans. Halo Wars boils down the RTS to its most basic concept, and in doing so it makes one of the most accessible games in the genre, an easy recommendation for someone's first RTS game. Being simpler doesn't remove the need for strategic gameplay, it just makes those strategies easier to understand. You still need to think about what units you'll need for an assault, you still need to think about unit placement, you still need to think about which targets are more important in a fight. Halo Wars doesn't abandon the strategy part of real-time strategy by dumbing everything down, it just makes the strategy much easier to understand for a casual player. The limitations that strangle a hardcore RTS player are the exact thing that makes the game so much more appealing to a casual player like me. The fact is, I am a console gamer, I don't play hardcore RTS games because, quite frankly, they scare me. If a game requires several YouTube tutorials to even understand the basics of what you're supposed to be doing, then I'm just not interested in playing. Halo Wars is a game that you can jump into quickly and easily. It's approachable in a way that the majority of RTS games aren't. Halo Wars wasn't trying to aim for an RTS loving audience, it was aiming to be a gateway RTS and attract new people to the genre. I'm not sure if it really succeeded in that, but I don't think that goal is a bad one, and with the Halo license I'm sure it brought in a lot of shitter fans who would never play an RTS game otherwise. Considering that Halo is something that Microsoft pushed on them, Ensemble did an expert job in capturing the Halo aesthetic and vibe. It looks right, it sounds right, and it feels right, while still managing to carve out its own style distinct from the mainline games. It carries over Halo's cinematic qualities expertly, and while the music has a very different flavour, it feels right for the franchise. Heresy! Remove this filth! Take cover! These guys just don't know when to quit. Being a prequel, it does a lot to expand the universe of the Halo trilogy. For the first time we see Spartans other than Master Chief in an earlier, more bulky looking version of the armour and see human settlements outside of Earth. Me and Arbiter are previous to the one in the trilogy, and they all feel authentic and within the pre-established setting. Ensemble was clearly trying very hard to make as authentic a Halo game as they possibly could. The downfall is the story itself. Halo Wars plot and main characters just aren't up to par with the trilogy. There are four main characters which the plot follows, and each of them fall into pretty clear archetypes and never deviate from their predefined characterization. There's Captain Cutter, the mustachioed stoic and logical leader, Professor Anders, the science advisor who follows the absent minded professor archetype, caring more about scientific discoveries than her own safety and requiring rescue because of it. There's Serena, the sassy shipboard AI, who's generally there to make a snarky comment at the end of each cutscene and handle all the boring admin. And finally, there's Sergeant John Forge, the most 2000s video game man you've ever seen in your entire life. He's cocky, he's got scars and a shaved head, and he's voiced by Nolan North. He is the platonic ideal of a 2000s soldier man and there isn't even a shred of irony about it. And honestly, I kinda love him for that. Hey, how about one for the scrapbook, Professor? If you don't mind, Sergeant, I'm trying to document this area for study. That's not to say the cast is boring or unlikable. They're fine, they get the job done, but they don't leave quite the same impression as the supporting cast of the trilogy do because of that archetypal nature. And the main plot doesn't do loads to enthrall you either, being more of a meander than a well-structured plot. Despite it being the focus of the opening cutscene, Harvest actually occupies very little of the story. Only the first three missions are on Harvest, and two of those primarily exist as tutorials. 
the first the tutorial on basic unit control and commands, and the second on base building. What plot there is revolves around the Covenant's discovery of a Forerunner structure, which leads to a map of the galaxy, which leads them and the Spirit of Fire to Arcadia, another human colony, where you help evacuate some civilians, destroy a big dome around the Covenant dig site, and then Anders is kidnapped by the Arbiter and the Spirit of Fire has to chase after and rescue her. Why the structure and harvest pointed them to Arcadia is never actually explained. It's there so that the Covenant knows that Anders knows a bit about Forerunner stuff, but what that original map was actually pointing to is never elaborated on and does not matter at all. That's the kind of writing woven throughout Halo Wars. The mission to Arcadia is really only there so you can fight through some new locations and interesting gameplay challenges, like protecting some civilian evacuation vehicles or taking down a big stationary scarab. The plot required to get you to Arcadia is pretty inconsequential compared to these set pieces. The archetypal writing is extended to the villains as well. While this Arbiter has a fantastic, menacing look, he is also a very generic, big evil monster man who just wants to wipe out all the humans. The Prophet of Regret is a little more interesting, being the schemer that he is, but overall he serves the same function. Why don't we put the lady down and talk about this man to freak? As you wish. Stop! Anders, get out of here! I'll come quietly if you let him live. say that the story isn't bad, at least not by video game standards, it's just very clear that a compelling narrative wasn't the primary objective of the game, not in the way it is for the FPS games. This kind of whatever approach to stories in game is pretty typical of the era. Halo is an exception, not the rule. The reason that the game still feels so Halo-like despite not matching the storytelling standards is because of how thorough an adaptation it is of the mechanical lineage of the FPS games. Beyond just visually, there is a mechanical throughline between the FPS games and Halo Wars. A Warthog in Halo 3 and a Warthog in Halo Wars look the same, sound the same, and serve the same mechanical function. Fast, good against small groups of enemies, but a shot or two from a tank at its toast. There's more than one Spartan around, but they're still limited. With one exception in the campaign, you only ever get three at a time. But they're also the most versatile unit you have, with heavy weapons and the ability to board both allied and enemy vehicles to make them more efficient. On the Covenant side, things work the same way. All of the enemy types you've fought countless times in the FPS games are here serving the same functions. Wraiths don't have the damage of a scorpion tank, but they can shoot in an arc over terrain and other enemies. Jackals are anti-infantry and can make quick work of marines. The Arbiter himself is a one-man war machine of death. And of course, for a massive unit investment, you can call in a scarab to dominate the battlefields. Everything is visually exaggerated to make it easier to identify from a distance, but mechanically, a battle of Halo Wars feels the same as any battle in any Halo game. You're just controlling all of the battle instead of just one soldier. Halo Wars adds several new vehicles and units to the overall roster, like an anti-air wolverine or the little mini scarab looking things called locusts, but they feel perfectly within the Halo universe, like something you could have easily seen in the FPS games, but they were just at another part of the battlefields. Halo Wars low unit population limit likely has more to do with hardware limitations than true design choices, but it does have a side effect of evoking the same kind of tactical thinking as the two weapon system did for Halo 1. Limitations mean you have to make tactical decisions about what units you need for each conflict. The UNSC and the Covenant are balanced in an asymmetric way, which is the best, most fun way to balance anything. The general rule is that the UNSC hits harder and takes more damage, but they cost more and take up more unit slots. Where Covenant units are weaker and cheaper, but you can make more of them, and sometimes they can have a rechargeable shield. This perfectly recaptures the same feeling as the FPS games, where you're outnumbered and outgunned, but you can hit harder than they can. One of your units counts for at least five of theirs. The Covenant are playable in multiplayer, but unlike most RTS games with a faction system like this, there's no separate campaign for the Covenant, which leaves them in an odd place for multiplayer. It's often said that single player campaigns are just glossy tutorials for multiplayer, and while I usually think my critique is a little harsh, RTS games are a genre where an extended tutorial is appreciated. And Halo Wars campaign does a pretty good job in teaching you exactly how the UNSC work down to the minutiae so that you're well equipped for multiplayer. 
Whereas playing as the Covenant, you're being thrown straight into the deep ends. According to one developer on Twitter at least, Ensemble did have some rough plans to add a Covenant campaign as DLC, which would star the unnamed Brute Chieftain who serves as one of the multiplayer leaders to choose from despite not appearing in the campaign at all. Which would have been nice, but I imagine it's hard to work on that stuff when your studio doesn't exist anymore. That being said, I totally get why there wasn't a Covenant campaign in the base game. Halo 2 and 3 took time to add depth and nuance to the Covenant and show that they're not a pure evil organisation, but Halo Wars doesn't have the time or interest in that kind of depth, and so a whole campaign where you play as mustache twirling bad guys on a genocidal mission against humanity probably wouldn't have been overly fun. Although in saying that, a potential Covenant campaign wouldn't have to be against humans, as just like Halo 1, Halo Wars introduces the Flood as a surprise second faction halfway through the campaign. The Arbiter takes Anders to a Forerunner Shield world, a Dyson Fear type hollow planet. There's a fleet of ancient Forerunner Dreadnoughts there and the Prophet of Regret wants to activate them and use them against humanity, so you've got to stop him. Also, the Flood is on this world, for gameplay reasons and pretty much nothing else. There's no grave mind or overarching threat, they're just sort of hanging about. Mechanically, just like Halo 1, the Flood are not as interesting to fight as the Covenant. They're not quite a full faction as made clear by the fact that you can't play the Flood in multiplayer. They have a much more limited roster of enemies, with their only real special ability that they can infect and take over your infantry. But from the disconnected view of an RTS, that's not nearly as creepy as it is in first person. It's quite strange, the Flood almost feel as though they're in the game out of obligation rather than as an actual story element. The Flood being around doesn't raise the stakes like it does in Halo 1, they're treated more like the local annoying wildlife while you continue to fight the actual threat which is the Covenant. After four missions of fighting pretty much exclusively Flood, they go to just being a sort of pest on the edges of the map as the Covenant take over again as the primary enemy. This is after the Spirit of Fire is pulled inside the world in a very cool cutscene though, so it's not all bad. Fire isn't an amazing looking ship or anything, but my god do they know how to make it look good. I know it's a bit weird to praise a game's cutscenes so much because, well at that point I'm basically just talking about a movie, not a game, but the cutscenes of Halo Wars are really something special. The story may be bare bones, but at least it looks incredible. And they do manage to subvert at least one troll when damsel in distress Anders manages to escape capture herself rather than being rescued, even if she is then immediately rescued from the local flood wildlife. In the end, the climax is pretty much the same as Halo 1 as well, in that they use the Spirit of Fire's reactor core as a bomb to blow up the shield world and stop the Covenant from using the Forerunner ships. Sergeant Forge channels his pure 2000 soldier man energy and kills the Arbiter on his own while the Spartans fight off a bunch of randos. And for the record, I would have kicked your ass the first time if the lady hadn't stopped me. But as a genre convention, someone has to stay and arm the bomb manually, so of course, being the hero man, Forge volunteers and sacrifices himself while the Spirit of Fire escapes. But without a drive core, they're not getting anywhere anytime soon, so they get into cryo chambers and prepare for the long trek home, as to be conveniently absent for the events of the original trilogy, but technically not dead, so they can bring them back later if they want. The final run of missions are a lot more fun mechanically than they are thematically anyway. Massive battles, with all of the tools at your disposal and both Covenant and Flood to deal with. Who do also fight each other, although not very much. First you have to carry the core up a series of ramps, which is a memorable encounter, and then the final mission is opening the massive doors so that the Spirit of Fire can fly away. Not quite a Warthog run, but thematically similar. You might want to hold on to something. Closing your eyes might help too.
love its lackluster writing, there's a part of me that wants to praise Halo Wars' story maybe more than it deserves. As a purely mechanical campaign, it is well done with lots of variation in challenges. Missions where you need to play offensively, and missions where you need to play defensively, and some missions that require both at once. There's a lot about Halo Wars' story that has become better in retrospect. For example, Spartan Red Team, your three Spartans throughout the campaign, are barely actual characters. They have names, but never use them, and only one of them ever actually talks outside of in-game callouts. But Halo Wars 2, when it eventually rolls around eight years later, does a lot to flesh out Red Team and the rest of the cast, which makes them feel like stronger characters in this game in retrospect. Potentially, one of the most interesting story elements of Halo Wars is the inclusion of a timeline which shares glimpses into some of the significant historical events in the Halo universe, along with some personal details about the characters of the game. These entries are unlocked by doing various different things in the game, like completing missions, winning multiplayer games, and some collectibles within the campaign. And they are worth reading despite being short, like one about Professor Anders sending coded messages to her dad by hiding it in the Odyssey. Or Forge getting into a fist fight with one of the Spartans and coming to a draw because he's just that good, I guess. One even shares an important revelation about the trilogy, which you could potentially infer, but the Halo Wars here in this little text box confirms. The Prophets know about the connection between humans and Forerunners, and the war started to stop that secret from getting out and undermining the entire basis for their religion and society. Being one of the few RTS games that actually breached the console market, Halo Wars had an active multiplayer scene right up until the release of the sequel, which thoroughly replaced and outclassed it. I'm sure there's still some purists out there, but personally, I'm not one of them. And yet, maybe because of that lingering resentment over having their baby sent to another studio, Halo Wars remained kind of stuck in its own little corner of the Halo universe until recently. There was some sequel plans where it would be revealed that Forge had survived the explosion, instead being teleported away somewhere mysterious and rejoining the crew later on, but obviously with the closure of the studio, that didn't happen. There was a good while there where it seemed like Halo Wars was fated to be an obscure memory, a branch that the franchise would never follow again. But thankfully, we did eventually get a Halo Wars 2 helmed by new studio Creative Assembly. And Halo Wars has gotten its dues, with its Spartan armor and a whole host of Halo Wars themed cosmetics coming to Halo Infinite here in 2024. I think that Halo Wars 2 is a superior game in almost every way imaginable but a lot of its foundational ideas come from this game, so it gets to share in the credit too. Halo Wars aimed to be as revolutionary for the RTS genre as the original Halo was for the FPS genre. It wasn't, but that doesn't mean it was a failure. Well yes, it sucks that a studio died while making this game. At least their final game was a good one, with a lasting legacy. There's one other thing that Halo Wars symbolises, and that's the shift from Halo from a series of games, a trilogy, to a franchise with various spin-offs of all different genres. The beginning of the middle era of Halo, a time when we chronologically don't move forward from Halo 3, but instead move backwards and sideways in all different directions of the Halo universe. Halo Wars might not be the best story entry into that mythos, but hey, good enough is better than nothing, right? Captain, I would much rather stay awake to monitor this area. Professor, there's been no sign of the Covenant for almost two weeks. There's nothing to do. But Captain... But nothing, Professor. You got us all out of there alive. Get some rest. Not all of us, Captain. Not all of us. and a very special thank you to my patrons for your continued support. If you'd like to see your name up here or get access to Patreon exclusive videos or just support the work that I'm doing here, then please consider signing up. It would mean a lot to me. I've realised that I've gotten too good at doing that part and so the patron names don't stay up for as long as they used to because I used to fumble that bit some more, so I'm just gonna waffle for a little There we go. I'm just gonna waffle for a little bit so that you can see the patron names up here for longer. 
And of course, to see the previous entries in this series, click up here. Or for something a bit different, if you want to listen to me and my friend absolutely rip 2016 Suicide Squad to shreds, then why not check out my new podcast, Empty the Snyderverse, where we're going through every movie in the DCEU.